So about a year ago, I joined Cisco. And my role at Cisco, if you want to ping people to let them know this is live, you can totally do that. I mean, you may want to join. Um, so I joined Cisco and the goal of my role was to do what we're calling visioneering. Think of it kind of like a futurist role, but I'm not necessarily developing my own theories. I'm listening and considering and pulling in actionable future predictions to try to apply them to Cisco, uh, but very specifically about um, people and experiences that people are going to have with Cisco rather than our technologies, for instance. So what I learned isn't changing WebEx. Um, what I learn is taking WebEx and introducing it in a different way. It's not creating servers, it's not creating software, but it is considering how people engage with hardware and software after the fact. Um, so to do that, I actually uh, create and consider unique, um, unique factors that are applicable to Cisco related to anything from enterprise technology and consumer technology to the future of economies and supply chain and work and human innovation. Um, and it comes down at the end of the day to the future of human machine interaction and how that impacts Cisco. So within that role, I've been paying a lot of attention and I'm gonna share my screen, um, a lot of attention, ooh, I got screen two, now nah, I'm good, um, to the future uh, after COVID. Wow, that's really exciting. Um, so the future of what life looks like after COVID. And I, I thought that would be a pretty cool thing to share, um, given the fact that, hold on, let me see if I can make this a presenter view. Um, yeah. Uh, the future after COVID, because I thought this was a really interesting topic. There are some things that we know, and there are some things that are a little more subtle that you may or may not be familiar with. And so that's what I wanted to talk about today. Some of those somewhat unusual um, things that you may not be aware of that are happening in the wake of COVID. Now, what I wanna do is I'll leave time for questions at the end. And I wanna make sure that you all are, uh, if you put questions in the chat, I can't literally see the chat right now, so I will address it at the end. But um, I also want to hear from you what your predictions are, what you're hearing, or interesting things um, that you want to ask about. So please do that conversation and those questions um, as we move forward. Um, so I've already introduced who I am. From what I know, and because I see my screen, tell me who you are as well. Actually, I'm going to go out um, to see if I can get that information from y'all. Let me see. So who are you guys? What is your different, what are your different roles? It looks like we don't have quite enough people to put that, but please do as you, as you look into this and you want to share, you know, who you are, I'd love to see who that is. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and dig in. Um, okay, the first thing I wanted to talk about is de-urbanization. So historically, you think about Silicon Valley, um, you think about Austin, you think about New York City. These are really common places for, especially in technology, for people to gather. Um, what we do know is that remote work is only going to become expected. It will become ubiquitous um, because of the fact that we now have the infrastructure to support it. But what's happening in those areas, especially right now, San Francisco and New York City, this is what we're seeing a lot in those areas. That rich talent pool is moving out of the city because they can. As they're doing virtual work, they're buying a real estate. Real estate has just exploded in certain areas of the country. So keep an eye on this. It's a very, you may have more people moving to Chattanooga, um, which would be very interesting. Or Atlanta, moving out of Atlanta or moving to Atlanta from New York City you know, on the East Coast. So um, it's going to be interesting to follow the trend of dis a distributed workforce um, investing in suburban and more rural areas um, doing work from afar. Um, what this does, I'm going to go back and let me see if I'm, yeah, I'll talk about that in a minute. But this is an interesting trend that's a real estate trend. Um, 
Another one is supply chain diversification. Um, this is one that when, okay, because when COVID happened, the supply chain in China, because of all the, the complexity of the, the virus, what happened is, as we all know, having a difficult time getting bread, being unable to get masks, being un unable to get the simple things that we needed, the foods we needed, toilet paper. Um, what happened, it wasn't just people stockpiling because that was definitely happen as, uh, happening as we all remember. Um, what happened as well was that the supply chain had been shut down because of the lack of talent because so many people were sick. Um, and it wasn't just in China that this was happening. This was happening globally in Malaysia or the Philippines or India or places where there was manufacturing or there was, there was stuff that was coming through. But the fact is, a lot of it was happening in China. They're a huge trade partner. And I know that that's, a, we're not going to talk about that right now because it's a controversial topic. Um, but what companies recognized and realized is how much they were handicapped by such serious um, uh, dependency on a supply chain that was so heavy in China. So what we expect to see is as a risk mitigation for them to pull back and really look at the diversification of supply chain. Now, what I think is going to be interesting is how IoT and robotics uh, might play into that. So what's happening there is that if you're not familiar with 5G, 5G is a technology that's gonna be able to equip IoT devices and mobile devices um, with more powerful, I think it's, I, I don't even, I can't even tell you how much more powerful um, internet capabilities or uh, data capabilities um, over the, you know, over the mobile network. Um, and it's going to enable these devices and these systems to be able to connect wirelessly um, in a more a rapidly, rapid fashion, far faster than what we have today um, with far more data. And so that's going to be really integral, empowering the future of IoT, because the more devices we have, the more communication has to occur. Also, Bluetooth 5 and Wi-Fi 6. Look into these technologies if you're not familiar with them. They are all more powerful connections um, that are moving us towards that ambient internet uh, future that we want to see. We want to see it being like air ambi or, you know, electricity is everywhere, but like air, it's just accessible. So um, moving towards that, you have these trends, but um, I'm curious to see as we're looking at supply chain, it's not just a global diversification. I am curious to see how the ex um, interest in robotics accelerates that because the human factor, getting humans involved in the supply chain has shown to be a handicap. Um, not only just coming from China, but actually having people involved. So how can they mitigate their risk also by investing in robots that don't get viruses um, or don't become sick? Um, and so this is very interesting. Now, in some contexts, what we saw in Walmart recently is they actually had um, robots that were doing, I think it was inventory. And so in their stores, they had actually purchased, I think, a couple thousand robots to do inventory. But then what happened was that that actually they stopped and they pulled people back in because people were doing a better job. So as we're looking at the supply chain and looking at robotics and robotic process automation, um, I'm very curious to see how not only the uh, the diversification or um, like of the supply chain globally, but also the implementation of robotics in supply chain based on the mitigation of human factors. That's going to be very interesting to see. Now, going back to everybody recognizes that uh, the I'm not even talking about this prediction because everybody knows that remote work is going to be status quo. It's already status quo, which I love. I've been remote for like years and years. Before I joined Cisco, I owned a business and I just worked wherever I wanted and it was fantastic. Um, so what's happening is that if you have remote work, all of a sudden, your talent pool expands exponentially. I have a friend in Austin who actually contacted me and said, hey, there's a product manager job right now. 
Um, it's in San Jose. Can you hook me up with it? But are they open to a candidate that's remote or out of Austin? And I reached out to the hiring manager and I said, are you all open to a remote candidate? And the response from the hiring manager was not yet, but we, you know, we will be hiring remote candidates. So you may see that remote candidates right now functionally are not what people are hiring for, but you will soon be able to see far more jobs working from Chattanooga for a company out of San Francisco. Um, and what that does for companies is, first off, they're getting a lot better at having the infrastructure to maintain that remote work. They're also getting back at remote work culture. Um, and so how do you establish and sustain a remote distributed talent pool? And so what happens there is that once they get better at this, they're going to be able to employ it more commonly. You're going to see remote jobs. But then also, if you're hiring in San Francisco, it's really expensive. New York City is super expensive. Um, so as you look at this remote workforce, there's a real opportunity to decrease your human capital costs. And um, that's going to be integral. Um, let me see. This is actually, I'm going to skip over here because not only is it the operational cost from a human capital perspective, it's also real estate. So what we're seeing in Austin is these companies who have beautiful facilities, um, same thing in San Francisco or the Bay Area generally, Amazon has a big building, but Amazon said, and I think Twitter said, I'm not sure, but Amazon said, you don't have to come back to the office ever. You can remote work forever. So how does that impact um, commercial real estate? Well, first off, it leaves a lot of dead space. These companies who have remote work are going to be like, we don't need this big space. They're going to decrease it. Um, these companies who want to move fully remote are going to be like, You're, we're just going to let our lease run out and kind of just leave. And so uh, commercial real estate investors, uh, but also commercial real estate companies um, are going to be very scared. <laughs> they're worried and they're going to have to scramble to find different um, alternative solutions. What you see is um, a lot of the growth in commercial real estate, like in Austin, we have a lot of co-working spaces. So as you prepare for the future of what that, that remote work looks like, um, this is something that you're going to see. How are they repurposing it? Keep your eye on that because it's going to be very interesting to see how they respond to this trend uh, of commercial real estate dead space. Um, very interesting to, to follow that. So um, this is one that actually follows that as well. So the gig economy, uh, for those who aren't quite familiar with that, that's the economy where people are doing freelance work. They're doing gig work instead of having W-2 jobs. Now, this was far more common going like from the, the Great Recession. What happened was that companies were unable to afford the W-2s. They needed to reduce, you know, their capital, um, their, their um, value, their stock market value, value just crashed. And so what they needed to do was they needed to reduce those expenses. And a lot of what they were doing was offloading W-2s. Um, and then what was happening, though, is they would find 1099s. They would find contractors to do work because it's less overhead. Uh, they might pay them the same per hour, um, but they wouldn't pay benefits. Um, it would be a contract so it's open and closed. Um, and the risk would be lower because you're going through a company who's um, uh, finding them and recruiting them, or you go directly to the freelancer. So the gig economy has flourished um, following the... Um, following the recession. But then what happened is the companies, as the companies healed, they started to hire more and more W-2s. Um, so a good example of that is design studios. They want to be innovative. So they're hiring instead of working with contractors or agencies, they're actually pulling that talent in house and um, building their own IP. However, um, as the economy is shifting, um, what happens is now we've hit another bump where companies are struggling. Cisco specifically, um, because of our, you know, what we do um, has, uh, is going through a labor reduction, which is not uncommon with large tech. It's just not. Um, but what's happening is it's going through a labor reduction uh, of a billion dollars by the end of the year. That's a lot of money. 
Um, and what's happening is that work still has to get done. Uh, but forcing that labor off, I was talking to one of my friends who's gotten laid off. And I said, look at contract work through Cisco. So even if they're not able to afford W-2s, perhaps they're able to mitigate that risk and pull you in on a project. A company did that to me. I got laid off in 2011. And two months later, three months later, they called me and they said, hey, can you do contract work for us? So it's not uncommon, but now it's going to be more common. Companies are getting more comfortable with, instead of human capital costs, shifting those to operational costs is very appealing. Um, and so you're going to see more of that for better or for worse, uh, because what happens is it does not provide the stability that generations, even Gen X and boomers saw when they graduated college or they graduated high school and they went into the workforce, it was much more common for them to have that stable job. That stability isn't there anymore. Um, it's much more common to find unstable work to have to freelance. Um, because companies aren't doing as much W-2 hiring. You know, in technology, there is a tech gap. So you may be seeing less of this, but um, you may, depending on what your level is, may be finding fewer senior level jobs. And so in that case, you either stay where you are or you're not able to find jobs or you get laid off. And then all of a sudden you have to tune 99. So um, the challenge here as well is when you look at um, that entrepreneurship in countries where, like India, as they're you know down, like they're they move from full-time employees, W-2 employees, to contract work, like in engineering, for instance. Um, how's that going to affect the Indian economy? And because in India they make way less than we do, um, and if it's harder to find a job um, in some of these um, com these countries, um, the economic impact can be very significant to their families. Um, to their family trees, you know, looking down generations. So as we look at the gig economy, millennials tend to like it sometimes. They want that freedom to move around. But as we look at different um, groups of people, that instability, that economic instability that's following COVID, because companies are going through this, you know, shuffling off of W-2s again, that is going to be more challenging for a longer period of time to more people. And it's going to be interesting to see what the long-term impact is of companies becoming far more um, uh, adept at employing gig economy strategies and talent strategies uh, for contract workers. So that's going to be very interesting. Let me see. Okay. This is another thing. So I, I talk a lot um, about, I talk a lot about customer experience, about experience generally. Um, but one of the very interesting things is as we are separate, as we are distant, and we have virtual relationships, the question is, how do we humanize our relationships from afar? How do we really build a connection? Um, and that's a challenge. That's not only like video calls, because collaboration technologies like video, like WebEx, I'm not going to say the Z word because I work at Cisco. Like WebEx, um, actually what they do is they are able to create this narrative um, and this connection. But increasingly, millennials, like over 60% of them actually prefer digital experiences and digital contact over human contact. So not only looking at COVID and looking at historically digital native or you know Gen Y or millennials, um, but what we're also seeing is COVID is accelerating that virtual interaction. And so as we look at experience, which is what, you know, a core focus of mine, I have to really think about the humanity behind the technologies that we employ. Now, this is not just COVID. Um, there's uh, the industrial revolution that we're in right now is the fourth industrial revolution. It focuses on technology dark technologies, deep tech, exponential tech. Um, dark is um, distributed ledger, artificial intelligence, robotics, and quantum computing. Uh, some people would just bucket them all together in exponential technology. So this is really cool stuff that's happening, like really neat. Um, people say the future of that is going to be this collaboration or combination of things like crypto and AI and robotics or IoT and 
5G and, you know, some kind of biotech. I mean, there's so many things that people are talking about that's the, the combination in, of multiple technologies that are emerging, multiple exponential technologies. Um, I, AI, NLP is going to be the future of all of this, by the way. Um, so if you're not familiar with AI and NLP and really get to know that better. Um, but what we are going to see is entering the fifth industrial revolution. It's going to be less about just tech and more about human and machine. Right now, human and machine has been interfacing with a website, for instance. But as we look forward, we're going to be looking for meaningful interactions uh, with machines, trustworthy, building trust uh, with systems. What does that look like? And how do we avoid the creep factor? So there's um, at CES this past year, 2020, back when CES was in January when it was in person, which it makes me very sad that I don't know when CES is going to happen again in person, but there was a solution that um, Samsung uh, introduced called Samsung Neon. Uh, they call it digital life. Check it out. It's amazing, but it's not alone. Um, avatars, um, digital avatars um, are getting tremendous VC funding. Um, and what happens is in this age of virtual, um, having a virtual agent that is almost um, impossible to, to tell that it's not human, um, these digital agents are going to be really awesome um, ways to uh, not replace, people don't want to say replace, supplement um, the interactions that people have. Um, so check out, you know, artificial like avatars, check out avatars. Like I said, like a bunch of money is going into this enterprise VC money, VC money generally tens of millions of dollars, but it's still a little nascent. Um, so check it out, see what happens in the next five years. This is going to be far more interesting, but what COVID has done is all of the virtual has accelerated this. So it's not that it's brand new. It's that what COVID has done is it has amplified it and evolved it and accelerated it faster than anyone could have imagined. And that's why it's getting so much more VC funding. So check that out. It's very interesting um, to see more about it. Um, another one is a creative destruction of higher education. This is something you've seen. You've seen students that are doing virtual schooling and they're like, why are taking semesters off? Uh, at Harvard, why am I paying $56,000 a semester for tuition at a school where I'm not in person? What is this experience? Um, looking at distance education, um, looking at how to educate students from afar. Pedagogy is the study of um, how to educate. It's instructional design, how to educate in the most effective way. Um, to get the best retention because people only retain like 10% of what they learn after a period of a month. So how can you really get that retention um, from afar? And this is a, a topic of study. This is something people are exploring, but but families are sitting down with their, their kids and saying, I don't know, don't you want to just go to community college? Do you want to you know step away from the private school and go to the public school? So what you're going to see is you're going to see public schools. Um, in my opinion, community college is getting a lot more action. Online degree programs and online schools getting a lot of action. Public schools um, branching out to offer online degrees, like uh, not just accredited, but um, schools that are well-renowned, not just Arizona State, but the Arizona State model um, can be applied more broadly. It's going to be, become more common. Arizona State is has a tremendous um, and a well-respected online degree program, by the way. Um, but then you're also going to see um, private schools floundering because people are not going to want to pay that when they recognize the value of being able to do it differently. So you're going to see creative destruction. And Coursera is a great example of a company that's actually working with, I think, IBM and other companies to craft these programs that are educational and 
um, really pour into professional development, but it's not your MBA anymore. So it's going to be very interesting to see um, the impact of creative destruction. Um, so this is another one. Um, this actually should say exponential growth of business process automation. So um, business process automation is also right now called robotic process automation. Um, it's a little different. Business process automation doesn't necessarily have to be done with software. It can be done with, you know, human contractors and different, there are, there are a lot of ways to do it, but um, robotic process automation is taking over business tasks. Um, and as you have people remotely getting software systems to be able to take over those tasks because they're being done over the internet anyway, is far more alluring. Um, again, it's the acceleration of that digital transformation that is happening post COVID. So you're gonna see a growth in robotic process automation, business uh, process automation. And what the result is of that is that all of us are going to become more strategic because those bots or that software is gonna take over. It's already happening, as you know. Um, it's going to be taking over part of what we do today. And so people are gonna lose jobs to a degree, but what's also gonna happen is it's going to liberate us um, to be able to do more strategic tasks. They're gonna help us. Um, they're gonna give us more insight faster so we can do our jobs better. Um, and that's gonna elevate information workers up to knowledge workers. If you haven't ever seen the DIKW, the wisdom pyramid, um, what you have is you have data. Data is information that your computer might capture, but you have to interpret that data. That's where information comes. Information says, this is what the data says. Then you have knowledge. This is what the data means. Then you have wisdom. This is how we should respond. So what happens is robots are going from these data systems to actually information systems. And they are taking over the jobs of people who used to interpret the data. And so those people who used to interpret the data, they're like, well, I, I, I need to better understand what my company needs, what our strategy needs. And I need to be able to be the one to represent that, to say, these are our options. This is what this means. It's the, these are the options we have to go forward. And even taking it a step further to become more strategic to say, and this is what we should do. So let's go ahead and test it. So the growth of these business automation, process automation systems is going to be something that, again, has been accelerated uh, by the virtualization of and distribution of teams uh, to more commonly and powerfully employ um, online technologies and collaboration technologies. Um, so that's gonna be really interesting to see. So these are some, this is like far from, far from everything that is going on. Um, it is gonna be a ride. It's gonna be very interesting and, and fascinating. Um, and so these are just some of the things I'm paying attention to. So I, I want to see if anyone has any questions. I know we have a really small group. And I also want to see what the changes or technologies or trends are that you all are seeing. Um, so if you want to add something in the session, um, yeah, the session notes. Let me see. All right. Um, I have some questions, but these are, I believe these are all for other, yeah, other chats. So uh, yeah, let me know if you have any questions. Also, I'm happy to uh, ask questions after the fact. So you can tweet me at, at E-R-G-O, Annie, A-N-N-I-E. Um, but it looks like, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure there are any other questions. Um, well, stay here for a moment, but that that's it. Those are just some really high level things that I've noticed. Um, yeah, so include your questions, any, uh, any inquiries, I'm available on Twitter and also be available through the Drupal Chattanooga, Chattanooga group. Um, one thing I wanted to say that I, is kind of an elephant in the room, pun not intended, um, is the election. 
because Georgia is actually critical. So everyone's talking about it. The election and the response of the Biden presidency, given that if Biden becomes president, which I know all of these things are in the air, given the recounts that are going to have to be done because of all the controversy and the, the counting of the votes. Assuming, uh, if we assume that Biden will become president, the investment in these different technologies or these different systems or um, globalization, or I mean, it's going to be really interesting to see how that um, it's not just in the wake of COVID, it's COVID plus a new administration um, could impact a lot of these trends um, in a way that's just right now, I don't know what to predict, but I'll definitely be keeping my eyes open for it. Okay, that's what I got. Bo, anything else? you have any questions? Absolutely. Happy to talk about this. It's something I'm really passionate about. All right. So if you guys have any questions ongoing, just ping me. Um, happy to talk offline. And I wish you a beautiful coffee break, snack break <laughs> as, uh, as the day carries on. Okay. Thank you all. Have a great day. Bye.